This is the M4 MacBook Air and this is the M5 MacBook Pro. On paper, these are two very different machines, but there's a lot more overlap here than you might think. Looking at each of them, there are some obvious differences in how they look and what's inside of them, and of course the price, where the Pro is four to six hundred dollars USD more, but after having used both of these as my main machines, everyday use is very similar, and it's only in a few key areas where you feel any kind of disparity between them. There are also a few things in each of these that I think are somewhat overblown, and it can make it hard to know when to choose one over the other. So today I want to break that down and do an in-depth comparison of where these are the same, where they're actually different, and when it might make sense to choose one over the other. So with that said, let's get into it. This video is sponsored by Clean My Mac. Hey everyone, Kyle Erickson here. Since Apple started putting Apple Silicon in Macs, I feel like it's getting harder and harder to understand what you can actually get out of these machines with real world use. We're flooded with benchmarks and charts on how much better one machine is over another, which can kind of give this illusion that we need to spend more to get something worthwhile when in reality that isn't exactly the case. Everyday tasks, even on older M1 machines, won't really feel any different than the ones we're looking at today. And even with more demanding use cases, you've got to have a pretty good idea of what your limitations are in your current workflow and a feel for these current Macs to see what they're truly capable of and what their limitations are. So let's just try and demystify that a bit. For starters, design-wise, these are the two smallest MacBooks that you can buy. After spending a couple of weeks reviewing the monster 18-inch blade laptop and coming back to these, they're so nice to pack around and work on, and the build quality of each is fantastic. This Air is the 13-inch model in sky blue, where the Pro is the 14-inch in silver, and you do have a much wider color selection in the Air, with up to four options instead of two in the Pro, but the most meaningful differences design-wise are related to the size here. While the surface area is very similar, the air is a tad lighter and thinner at 2.7 pounds and 0.44 inches thick versus 3.4 pounds and 0.61 inches in the Pro. With the Pro being a little bit thicker, it adds room for a fan for better cooling. The air is completely fanless, which will have an effect on performance that we'll get into in a bit, but the added thickness in the Pro also makes room for an HDMI port, and in general you've got a wider port selection there, with three Thunderbolt 4 ports, HDMI, an SD card reader, and a headphone jack, where the air only has two Thunderbolt 4 ports and a headphone jack. If you're using either of these as just a laptop, I would say the two USB-C ports are probably enough in most scenarios. If you're a photographer or creator, you might want that SD card reader, and sometimes it is nice to have USB-C ports on each side in case a desk you're at only has cables that reach to one. And if you are working at a desk using your MacBook as a desktop machine, the Pro does have some advantages there. That HDMI port gives you a dedicated monitor output that opens up the other three USB-C ports, so it's much less likely that you'll need to buy a USB hub or a dock. When I was a full-time software developer working on an Air, I always found I'd be using one port for an external monitor, and the other might be hooked up to a phone that I was building an app on, and if there was ever anything else I needed to hook up, there was always some trade-off involved. That's why I started using USB hubs and docks in the first place, which I do find are a little more convenient regardless of which laptop you have, but nicer hubs or docks can get pricey, so it's just an added cost that you may want to keep in mind. The Thunderbolt 4 USB-C ports are all relatively the same between both models, where the Pro is just a tad faster. Again, nothing that you would ever notice in real-world use, and likewise, the Pro can support up to three high-res monitors along with the built-in display, where the Air can only support two plus the built-in screen, but Realistically, I don't know that many people are going to be using more than two monitors with their Mac. Now, the built-in displays themselves, I would say are likely one of the biggest differences between these models, but 
At the end of the day, both are great. The Air has a 13.6 inch liquid retina IPS panel with a 2560 by 1664 resolution, 500 nits peak brightness, and a 1500 to 1 contrast ratio, which is outstanding for an IPS display, and the color accuracy is also fantastic, covering 99% of the P3 gamut. The Pro is 14.2 inches, so relatively the same. Having them side by side is the only time they feel any different, but the picture is definitely nicer as this is a mini LED XDR display with up to 1000 nits peak brightness in SDR and 1600 in HDR with a million to one contrast ratio that looks quite similar to an OLED panel. That means that black levels are much deeper and the picture tends to pop a lot more. The Air doesn't have HDR at all, so it doesn't have the same level of punch, but just a note on these brightness levels. In SDR, which is what we're looking at the majority of the time, the Pro only gets to that 1000 nits peak brightness outdoors when it's super bright out. Otherwise, it almost always maxes out at 600, where even side by side, it's hard to notice a difference over the air at 500 nits. The Pro will occasionally look brighter, as having better contrast does separate lights and darks in the image a bit more, and the Pro has a 120Hz variable refresh rate ProMotion panel, where the Air only has a 60Hz panel, which does mean the Pro does tend to have a lot smoother motion and animation. Now that can be great if you're someone who works with motion a lot, say if you're 3D modeling or if you're gaming, but if it's just for general usage or things that don't rely on higher refresh rates, it's nothing that I ever feel like I'm personally missing out on with the Air. The Pro also has the same level of color accuracy, so you can do any color critical work on either just fine. And outside of the added contrast you get with the mini LED panel, the actual picture itself looks very much alike. Similarly, the speakers are just a hair louder in the Pro model and are slightly more full sounding, but both are great for watching and listening to content, and how much of a difference the better speakers or display matters to you is definitely a personal choice. The nice thing is, it's easy to just go check these out in person at a store and see how much you notice a difference, but unfortunately, things like performance are a little more complex. Now, I've used both of these and tested them extensively, which should give you a pretty good idea of what you can expect there. But before we dive into all the details there, one tool that I use to both monitor and manage my performance comes from this week's sponsor, Clean My Mac. You guys often ask me what app I'm showing my system info in, and that's almost always Clean My Mac. If you haven't used it before, it's kind of like the all-in-one dashboard for keeping your Mac fast, organized, and feeling new again. It's got six main modules that handle everything from cleanup, performance tuning, and malware protection, to app management, and storage organization. And they've now added two new ones, Cloud Cleanup and the redesigned Space Lens. Space Lens gives you this really visual map of your storage, so you can instantly see what's taking up space and remove what you don't need. And with Cloud Cleanup, you can now free up space in your Google Drive and other cloud accounts without having to dig through folders manually, which is great if you're constantly syncing files or bouncing between drives like I do. It's the easiest way that I've found to keep my Mac and my cloud storage clutter free. And for Black Friday, Clean My Mac is offering 30% off, so check out the link below to grab that discount. All right, so like I said, performance is going to be something that has a different meaning to everyone depending on what they're doing. Both of these MacBooks that I have here are matched up specs wise with 10 core CPUs, 10 core GPUs with 16 gigs of RAM, and 512 gig SSDs. With the main difference, being that the Pro has an M5 chip and the Air has the M4. If we want to compare what that means in on-paper performance, you can see anywhere from a 12 to 17% increase in CPU benchmark scores going from the M4 to the M5, and about a 24 to 28% increase in GPU performance, which is fairly respectable for an iterative chip bump, but in real-world use, it can be hard to notice any real difference. If all you're doing is browsing the web, answering emails, or just using your Mac for productivity and regular everyday tasks, 
These will both feel the same, and frankly, even an M1 machine is going to be fine for those types of things. Even if you're doing graphic design or photo editing, provided you're not doing any crazy batch processing with raw photos or something, both of these are completely fine, and you rarely ever feel any kind of friction. But the same goes with coding, where if you're working on small to medium sized projects, things are nice and snappy. I've worked on my new website on both of these machines, which is a combination of a Next.js frontend that uses WordPress as a backend API, part of which runs locally and part that runs on Docker, and there have been no issues. And my smaller mobile projects that I tinker with have no problem running an Android Studio or Xcode with emulators and simulators open. Again, compile times are a bit faster on the M5 and benchmarks, but unless you're working on super large projects, it's very likely the difference won't be perceivable. And even when it is, the M4 is still quite impressive. There may be more nuanced programming use cases where the M5 does pull ahead more, but in a general sense, I don't feel like I notice any difference personally unless I'm actively measuring it. With video editing and more graphically intensive applications, that does start to shift a little depending on how much stuff you have going on. If I'm editing a 4K timeline with a couple of tracks and 5.9K H265 10-bit footage, both of these machines handle the actual editing part just fine. Provided you don't have any super resource heavy effects, everything feels smooth, and the only real difference I notice is the fan noise on the Pro M5. Because this base M5 only has one fan instead of the two you get on the higher end models, it spins up a lot more frequently than I'm used to. It's constantly on while I'm editing, and it gets pretty loud when I export audio or video. But that being said, export times are still noticeably better here compared to the Air. Video exports take about twice as long on the M4 Air, where a video like this one generally takes about a half hour and that gets cut to about 15 minutes on the Pro M5, which in large part is because the M4 is fanless, so it does have to throttle performance more than the M5. Technically, they share the same media engine, so in theory, they should get pretty close. And if I throw the air on a cooling pad, like this Razer one that I have, it can get closer to 21 minutes. So you can add something like that to even things out, but if you're exporting a lot of videos or working on bigger projects, that's one area where the Pro M5 clearly pulls ahead. Audio renders mirror that as well, with the M5 being about 40% faster if you're stacking heavy plugins, but honestly, if you're diving into more advanced audio or video work, film simulations, graphics plugins, those kinds of things, you'll probably want to step up to a Pro or a Max chip, but you can get a lot out of both of these. When I was reviewing these and using them as my only Max, my workflow was basically editing as far as I could go without using heavy plugins to keep things smooth. Then I would slap those on at the end and hit export and go do something else. You just end up having to be a little more patient. That's also true for things like 3D modeling, where, again, you're going to be fine on either of these for lighter stuff, like designing 3D prints and Fusion or Blender, but if you move to more complex 3D workflows, both are going to bog down and feel quite slow. Render times in Blender follow the same pattern as video and audio exports. The Pro M5 pulls ahead, but both are usable, and in games, they're okay. I'd only use them for casual gaming, maybe in a hotel room or something, where in Cyberpunk 2077, for example, the M5 can hit over 60 FPS at full HD with dynamic resolution, while the Air sits closer to 42 FPS. Some games do chew through RAM, so you'll see memory swapping kick in and hit the SSD a bit, but for most things, I haven't been overly concerned with running out of memory. Everything up to this point has run smoothly on both, as long as you're mindful about not doing too many things at once. But if that does concern you, both can be upgraded to 32 gigs of memory. 
Obviously, you can do the same with storage if you want to, with a slight difference being that the Air is only upgradable to 2 terabytes, where the Pro can go up to 4. And the SSD is technically much faster in the Pro M5 with roughly twice the speed. But again, there are very few instances where you'll actually notice that in the real world. Probably the only other thing that may be noticeable is battery life, where the Air advertises up to 18 hours of battery life and the Pro goes up to 20 four. Neither are going to get that high with actual usage, and you can get a full day of regular usage with each on a single charge, but because the M5 does have a much larger battery at 72 watt hours versus 54 in the air, it does feel like you can get a few more hours out of the Pro before you have to put it on the charger. I've also noticed that the M5 does use more power while using the media engine, specifically while exporting audio and video, but it also finishes a lot quicker, so the trade-off kind of balances them out. And honestly, as someone who has spent the last month or so testing out Windows laptops, these are both the cream of the crop in terms of battery life. When it does come time to charge, both will give you roughly a 50% charge in a half hour and a full charge in under two, where the Air charges at a maximum of 70 watts and the Pro charges up to 96 watts. And most of the other things like wireless connectivity are exactly the same between these with Wi-Fi 6E and Bluetooth 5.3. All things considered, I think the determining factor when choosing between these specific models aren't necessarily performance related at all, but come down to the features that sit outside of it. Do you need more ports? Do you want a better screen with better sound? Or maybe you want something that's lighter and more portable? Those are the things that seem to make the biggest difference here. And if you're reaching for more performance that the Air doesn't have, the most logical step to me is to move up to the pro level chip rather than something like the base M5 that honestly doesn't feel all that different. If it were me, I would probably stick with the Air as it is $400 USD cheaper and it does what I need it to and I'm not so concerned with the benefits of the pro chassis but I would love to know what you guys think. Is there anything here that you feel like would push you towards one of these or is there something here that is a deal breaker for you? Let me know in the comments down below. That's all I got for you today. I hope you found this video useful or enjoyable. If you did, feel free to hit that like button. If you want to see more tech related content or help me build a benchmark app to measure anxiety, please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next upload.